Uh, good part of day, folks. Good evening for us here on the eastern seaboard, eastern uh, side of the U.S. Uh, welcome to the uh, largest and fastest growing and the most active large-scale scrum uh, community. Uh, this one is uh, based out of New York City, but has gone viral globally. Uh, today, we have a special guest. Uh, it's the returning guest, and we have met uh, this person a uh, number of times in the past in person and also virtually. Uh, Gordon Weir, he's my good friend and colleague, uh, originally from New Zealand, but uh, by for the last, I would say, what, 20 plus years has been living and working in the United States. He's the hands-on experienced software engineer, uh, has worked in various industries, um, spent a lot of time with uh, within consultancy area uh, space, has worked with IBM, UBS, uh, Merrill Lynch, uh, pretty much all over the map. And he has a very um, insightful hands-on experience with product development and product management uh, in fintech um, and beyond. I, I know him especially from fintech area. And uh, in the past, he has given very galvanizing, I should say, very provocative um, sessions that engage many people. So today, I'm hoping to have Gordon um, you know, do the same and, and really keep us all engaged and awake. Uh, so uh, Gordon, without any further ado, uh, hopefully, I, I don't think I did the justice describing. Uh, no, you did great, thank you. Yeah, and uh, uh, be back. Yeah. You can I fill think, in the blanks, yeah. I, th I think uh, the last time I talked must have been 2020, right? Like January. Right, we did this at Microsoft, if I'm not mistaken, and we had a room full of people, and uh, that was a very yeah. interesting experience for us. Yeah. It was it was a similar topic actually because I was looking I was looking through and it, and, and the topic that I covered was um, the complexities of product development and and, and, pro and product discovery. Um, so just. I mean, obviously, I, I prefer to talk in person, but you know, situations are as they are. So, you know, apologies for us having to do this virtually. Um, and I also, I've got a couple. I've got two black labs, uh, and and I just heard my son is downstairs and he's uh, he's practicing his guitar, so electric guitar. So, apologies for any noise. If, the, if anything, if any human or dog walks past me, then you'll hear my two black labs. Um, so I'll try and I'll try and mute as quickly as possible because it's nearly deafening. Um, but, you know, apologies for that. I also like to, um, as I'm sort of talking about stuff, I like to get your input and, and you know, often I'll say, but can you raise your hands um, and just to tell me something. So cool if you had your cameras on so I could see that. But I also understand if you're at home as well um, and, and you're not as lucky as Ben in his cool, uh, in his cool room, um, then, then you may not be in a position where you can turn your camera on. But, you know, if you can, that would be really appreciated. Um, so I've been in the software industry for a long time. Um, I, I used to have some slides that sort of showed where I used to work and for how long, but I've taken it out because it's really depressing. Um, now I'm sort of getting a bit older. Uh, um, I, I, and as Gene said, I've worked in uh, product management, software product development, et cetera, et cetera. So I've sort of got across the whole gamut um, and, and learned an, an amazing amount on the way. Uh, I introduced Agile. Um, to UBS with a lot of resistance in about 2004, 2005. Uh, and I introduced Les uh, and, and Gordon Craig Barman to UBS in 2008. Um, and ever since then, I've been a massive fan of Les and, and how it works and the thinking that goes with it. Um, so the new new product development game, I don't know how many of you know it? And normally I'd say show, show of hands if you, if you know the new new product development game and what it is. Uh, there's a paper written in, um, in 1986, and that sort of scares me in many ways because the, the concepts in it and the learning in this, in this paper are, are so powerful and, and actually you know, still are being continuously you know, proven today. I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Marty Kagan, um, but he will expound the virtues of empowered product teams. Uh, and he's even written a book called Empowered, which I reference later on in his, in his talk. Um, which is directly related back to the concepts that were written in 1986. And, and this 
paper was driven off the back of a survey done in 1981, excuse me, which found that, that um, across 700 companies, and they believed that at least a third of their revenue would come from new products in the 80s. Um, and therefore, you know, developing and rapidly developing new products is, you know, it, it comp would provide competitive advantage. Now, I think about it now, I imagine um, that the revenue from new products in, in our decade and in, in our lifetime now is significantly higher than just a third. I mean, no one in their right mind would go and buy an iPhone 8. You could if you wanted to, but you wouldn't, right? You buy the new products. And actually, we're conditioned to buy new products as well. So, you know, development of new products means things like, you know, speed and flexibility and deep innovation. Um, but one of the things that this paper talked about primarily was not necessarily the processes that they followed. In fact, it didn't really talk about that at all. It talked about the, con the construct of the people and the, and the teams involved in new product development and found that without any exceptions, the most successful product development companies were the ones that incorporated the idea of these teams, which we're gonna talk about in a bit. And just to give you an example, um, what I wanted to do, but again, I only can see Ben and Jean, but um, I wanted to ask of, of all of you who, who have, who's worked in what you'd call an empowered product team and felt, and felt empowered to design and implement completely new products for, for markets and, and for customers. I'm assuming it's a small number, right? Because it, it is. Even after this paper was written in 1986, very, very, very few companies actually work this way. Right? And, uh, and there's a lot, that I don't think it's really understood why not, but I've, I've got my theories, which we can maybe talk about later in the question and answer period. I don't want to go into that too, too much depth. But I want to give you an example of, of, a, of an empowered product company, um, Netflix. I, was, I, I went on a, uh, a course that was run by Gibson Biddle, who was... The head of product at Netflix during its massive growth. He's not there anymore, but he 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 took you know the whole streaming um, business on uh, and, and led the product evolution for there. For that, there was one. They have a number of different product lines. One of them was um, onboarding, and the head of on the onboarding product, the product lead, um, made a decision, and she made a decision that um, after twenty eight days. You know, when you sign up for Netflix, you get the first 30 days free or the first month free. Um, what product companies generally do is they don't tell you that your 30 days is coming up and then start billing you without any warning, right? And what they did have, because Netflix puts the customer first and they always try and delight their customers. If you ring up their customer service call center and say, look, I didn't mean to continue my, my uh, subscription. Can you please cancel it? They'll cancel it and refund you the month that you've been charged for, which is really good. But what she decided to do was to um, send you an email after 28 days and say your, well, actually, except for, yeah, 28 days, say that your service is nearly, your, your free subscription is nearly up. Would you like to continue? Right. And that actually was going to cost Netflix $50 million in lost subscriptions, but they did it anyway. And it was her decision, no one else's. Right. It wasn't, they didn't have to go to the CEO. It didn't have to go anywhere else. They didn't have, even the head of product wasn't, wasn't an able to make a decision, yes or no. It was entirely her decision. So that's a real example of, of empowered product leadership and an empowered product team. She made the decision, her product team made the decision that that was the best thing to do for the customers of Netflix. And, and the result of that would be a better feeling about Netflix as a company as opposed to you know, the annoyance you get when you suddenly start getting charged for something you didn't want to be. So I think that's a really good example of, of empowered product team. So um, I wanted to put it back in the context of product development and what this new new product development game is. It was one of the primary, can you see my, if I put my mouse over something, can you see it or no? No, you can. Yeah. Oh, cool, well, that's good. Um, so the new new product development game, Lean and the Agile Manifesto were the three primary influences of Scrum. But interestingly enough, Scrum came about in the 90s and the Agile Manifesto didn't happen until, what, 2001 at Snowbird, right? Lean, obviously, prior to that. So the primary influencer of Scrum as a software product development method was, or framework, was a new, new product development game. And the thing that Jeff and Ken really liked about the new, new product development game was the construct of the team and the idea of what they call moving the ball down the field together. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. But I wanted to bring it back into context um of 
Scrum, Less, and the, the product development game and how it fits together. So let me um, explain a bit about rugby. Um, I'm from New Zealand, as Jean said, so it's, an, it's our national sport kind of passion, to be honest. Actually, I've made an observation that um, everyone's national sport or the sport that they consider to be the, the, the sport that their, their country's best at, they call football, right? So in New Zealand, we call rugby, we call it football. Um, in America, you call um, Ameri uh, football, and actually, I think I was watching a game the other day, the high school game, and it only touched someone's foot about 10 times. It's not really football, right? And neither is rugby, to be honest. It's always in your hands. But um, you call your primary sport here football, which is American football. And in Europe, the primary sport that they call football is what you guys call soccer. Right. So there's, there's something there. I just thought that was a bit of an interesting. Um, so we call we call rugby. We call it football. Uh, this is uh, scrum in rugby. So uh, the new product development game, Tanaka and Tanachi, used the term scrum in the paper, right? And Jeff and Ken used the term scrum for a software development methodology. And the idea behind the scrum is that you're moving the ball down the field. But actually, this is a scrum. Both of these, what you call forward packs, uh, their, their gross weight is about one ton of humans, right? And they're pushing against each other in a scrum and then what's called the half back or fly half puts the ball in and then gets the ball back out of the back of the scrum, ideally, right? And that, it, this is called a set piece. Um, these don't move at all. <laughs> when you've got one ton pressing as hard as they can against each other, a scrum generally stays exactly still, right? And it's a big deal if you can make it move even a couple of feet. So the analogy is kind of uh, flawed, but you know, interesting nonetheless. Everything else to do with rugby is about running. Um, so the idea behind rugby is you have forwards, they're the ones that get in the scrum, um, and they have a set of roles that they can, they, they, there's, the, there's the front row, second row, and, and, and the, the loose heads, uh, and, and the um, flankers, and, and the number eight. And then there's the halfback, which I talked about in the backs. So in a set piece, they have a set set of roles and things that they do. But when they're playing rugby, all of them can pick up the ball, all of them can run with the ball, all of them can kick the ball, all of them can pass. And that's the analogy that everyone in the, in the team has a specific skill and primary role, but they can do everyone else's job as well. And that's the thing that Jeff and Ken loved most about the paper is the idea that everyone could do everyone else's job. So the, the idea of creating a feature team, and I think, Gene was the last talk about um, feature team, and and it, and it was the speaker talking about you know adopting feature teams as a, as a model. Up. Yeah, good. Okay, so I, I thought I saw that, and 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 it's great because I've I've been using feature teams since about two thousand and eight, and we're going to talk about that as well. But that what I'm trying to what I'm talking about in this talk is the difference between a feature team developing software and a team that's about product development. So we'll talk about that too. Um, Japan, uh, this is <laughs> 2019, but I'll tell you a story. Japan has a rugby team, um, a national rugby team, and they beat South Africa in, in the 2015 Rugby World Cup, which is, um, it's like a D3 uh, college team beating a D1 college team. It's that, that much of a gap between, you know, South Africa's like number two in the world, number two or number one in the world, and, and Japan is pretty much like an amateur rugby team and they beat them. So um, just to link it back into the paper and, and Lee and the Japan is, an also, is really big into rugby now too. Pretty sure they don't call it football. So in 2008, I was in the middle of a really wicked hard problem. Um, and, uh, and I met Craig. Um, he's, a, he's a seriously smart guy. Uh, I was still in touch with Craig, um, as I know Gene is. I think he's coming soon, is he next month? Gene, in November, is that right? That's correct. Craig is teaching uh, large scale scrum for executives ne next uh, next month here in New York City. If you haven't been in a class with um, Craig, then I recommend you join one. He's oh he's, yeah, oh yeah. He, uh, he he when when you know you've met someone that's teaching you something when you feel really bad, and what I mean by that is you realise that what you've been doing is fundamentally flawed and you feel bad about it and you know that you've got a long way to go if your coach makes you feel good and about what you're doing and, and how you're operating then they're not teaching you anything craig will make you feel bad um, because you realize that how you've been thinking and what you've been doing is is generally flawed and and what you think is the right way of doing things is generally not um, the idea of phase containment phase sign off all that sort of stuff right is a, is a fundamentally flawed way of building products 
Um, he, um, one, of the, one of the main things he introduced me to is the concept of teams and team structure. Um, so, and I'll get into that right now. So cross-functional teams, um, they are an extremely good way of developing software. Um, and there's multiple reasons why. Um, I, I won't go into all of them. If you're interested in it, he's got a, uh, I think he's got a primer on cross-functional teams as well as the Scrum primer. Um, but one of the things that I know is that planning is a lot easier with a cross-functional team. Um, and the reason it's a lot easier is because you can push a feature or a story at a, at a cross-functional team and they'll do everything necessary to deliver it. And so rather than worrying about how many of these types of developers I've got and I'll have to have, this team will have to work on this component and this team will have to do some work on this component and these developers will need to change the UI and we'll need to change, we'll need to add some, uh, we'll need to change the data tables, we'll need to blah, blah, blah. And having to coordinate all of that work to get something done, you just give it to a feature team and they get it done for you. Right? So planning and thinking is so much simpler. Now, you could argue potentially that people in the feature team are not always busy, but that really doesn't matter because software developers will find things to, to do that are, that are of value regardless. Um, they also continually, as a feature team, becomes a really, really solid unit and they continue to improve how they personally build software. And it may be quite different, their team, from how other teams build software. But they're still doing it better and better all the time. And it doesn't matter that it's different because as long as they produce every sprint working code that follows your rules and guidelines for example you know, i need it to be test driven and i need to see you know acceptance test passing etc cetera, etc cetera, as my definition of done would demand then that's all good so there are fundamentally i think a great way to develop software there's reasons some reasons why you wouldn't use a feature a feature team um, and i've actually done some talks on why you wouldn't um, and mainly it's mainly because of non a, a very non-homogeneous environment you can't have someone who knows everything about everything, for example. So in which case you'd use something like a cat, which I have done myself. I had, a, had an environment when I was at Merrill's with something like 60 different um, components and software languages. You couldn't use a feature team to make a change in that environment. We needed to use a different met method and we use Canva. But generally for large scale software development, a feature team is definitely the way to go. So this is a story I often tell. This is when I was at UBS. Um, we, we started replacing, started a program to replace all of the back office processing for, um, for the equities business and, and ultimately the um, securities process. And so the full securities business, including prime brokerage and others. Uh, we replaced the, uh, an aging mainframe, which had multiple different languages in it. It had, um, it had, it had adopted uh, an ICL language called the Application Master, and it had IBM COBOL in there, and it also had Java running on the mainframe. So it was it was a bit of a mishmash and, and was very, very complex to manage uh, and expensive. So we embarked in 2006. I was a lot younger than I am now in 2006, and it seemed like a really cool idea to replace a mainframe. I, I would never do that again. Um, uh, it, it is too hard. Um, but, you know, at the time, it was, it was a learning experience, and we had a lot of fun doing it. And learned a lot, a lot. So initially we adopted, I'd love to see a show of hands. Who even remembers the Rational Unified process or the RUP? Hey, yeah. Gene, come on, you must remember RUP. Um, so the Rational Unified process was one of the very early iterative development methods. And it had, I uh, can't remember the phase names, uh, but you might have to help me out. At inception, elaboration, I think. Uh, development and transition or something like that. And, and they always got converted in most people's minds to analysis, design, development, and test. But actually, that's not what they're about at all. Um, the, the idea was it, during inception, you, you shape it up. During um, uh, elaboration, you, you tackle the yeah. risks, et cetera. Won't go into too much detail. We had six developers. We did the first release, and I think it was October. Uh, we got it live on, on Friday the 13th. We thought that was going to, you know, if we could get, we took suspicion and, uh, and didn't worry about it. We got, Friday 13th there. And then slowly over time, we built the number of developers. And we actually then, um, in mid 2007, I met a guy named Dean Leffingwell, um, who you know, went on to uh, popularize something called SAFE um, uh, and used his methodology. And in mid 2008, we, uh, we were in crisis, um, serious crisis actually. We started having major production incidents. Um, the team had plateaued, people were getting extremely stressed um, at one stage um, during you know up two to three weeks before release 
I had testers sleeping underneath their desks because they were working so late at night they just couldn't get home. Um, and then the natural result of that. And, and then we discovered we had these release trains, those of, know, those of you who know it, um, but the first sprint of every release train, we, did, we didn't plan on doing any actual development work. We just we knew we'd be cleaning up production for the first, for the first two weeks. Um, I, don't, I don't want to go into too much detail as to why. I'm not here to knock safe. I'm sure it's, it's, some people have made a very successful implementation of it. Um, but the main issue with it was late integration because SAFE still keeps component teams and then you do integration at the end. And they, they used to be called a stabilization sprint, I think. Um, and it was that stabilization sprint that everything finally came together and we tried to test everything. And then we ended up with serious production issues because we just couldn't test enough or um, get to the point of, of integrated quality. Uh, I was still pretty proud of what I'd done and the organization structure and I met by chance, found out that Craig was coming to town, and so I got him on a call and had a few of my people on the call as well, and proudly told him how we we're organised and stuff. And within about ten minutes of talking, Craig made me have that sinking feeling that I told you about, where I realised that we just got it fundamentally wrong. And he said, "Oh, that sounds interesting. I wonder if these following things are happening to you right now. You're, you're, redu you're getting a reduction in software quality. You're having production incidents. People are getting really stressed." I was like, "Good lord, how did he know?" Um, and then he introduced me and then we, we brought him in to help coach us in the concept of, of feature teams and, and large scale scrum. And this is sort of like, you see the explosion happening here. Then we adopted less sort of mid to late 2008. We did a, um, a massive, we, we were kind of ready. We, our heads were in agile. We had test driven development. We had automated testing frameworks and stuff. So we're kind of ready for it. So we, we got everyone in a room and they self-selected their their feature teams and they got on and started building software and we immediately saw an increase in, in velocity and what this is is we had two layers of feature points we had large scale what we call program feature points and then we had story feature points or story points and, and we use this large scale to sort of say how many features are we getting in in terms of points per release the first one took eight months to get maybe two or three feature points into production and then by the time we're in 2009, 2010, we were releasing into production every two days and we were releasing an amazing amount of feature points every two days, but the sort of two weeks that we're measuring there. So um, it's off the scale in terms of the increase in velocity and, and, and delivery quality. Um, so there's a lot of benefit for adopting team structures like this. Now I want to talk about the job of being a product owner. Um, who has been a product owner or, or taken the mantle of product ownership? I've done it. I've run product management groups and stuff. It's uh, and you, I'm not even going to read this, but the product the product owner is you know accountable for backlog story, you know effectively for story creation, for backlog prioritization, making sure it's visible and understood, making sure it's following all the acronyms like DEEP, etc. Um, and the product owner is fully accountable for this product backlog. Um, it's impossible. You can't expect one person to do that, and you can't expect one person to do that within a business context either. So if you're building software that's, say, at a bank, like I used to, where the software we build is enabling services to produce products or financial products that are sold in the market, then we're, you've sort of got layers of abstraction from the market itself. You've got software that's supporting a user to do a job that potentially enables a product in the market, or user or a system to do its job to enable a product in the market. So you sort of lose that context. And being a, a line manager doesn't make you a expert in software, software product development or uh, product innovation by any means. In fact, I've never really seen it. Um, I drew this picture last time and I, I stole it again. It's a really awful picture, so apologies for that stick, stick figures. But I've seen this phenomenon many times. The idea where um, a a team has adopted or a group of people have adopted agile and they learn that one of the things they should do is um is talk to the business on a daily basis it's, i think it's like principle number nine or 14 i can't remember in the agile manifesto um and, and they like to come and have start having conversations and interact with these people this person is working 14 hours a day anyway and then has you know five or six software engineers coming into his or her office asking for um or their office sorry uh asking, you know, how, where do you see the product going? Um, what are the acceptance criteria for the story, et cetera? They haven't got the one, the knowledge or the ability to be able to answer those questions. 
So let's go, finally, let's go back to the new, new product development game. And because uh, that was a bit of a digression and I was explaining, you know, software product development. So the teams and the studies that, and the investigation that the, that the authors um, did for, in the new, new product development game, they looked at um, the most successful products that had happened over the last sort of five to 10 years prior to writing the paper. Um, you know, the personal, the personal, um, the PC, the NEC PC, um, uh, Xerox copiers, the Honda City car. Um, and these were, these were companies that have produced highly successful, innovative new products. They were doing what they termed in the paper product development. But they weren't doing this, right? I'll go back again. They were doing product development, but the people that they talk about in the teams and, and what they studied weren't producing the product. They weren't in the sausage factory. They were coming up with what the product needed to do and how it was going to be implemented and what it was, what, what the context of that product was. So I just want to make that clear. They were they were coming up with new product ideas, not producing the product. Okay. <laughs> so was there a question? If you do have a question, just interrupt and ask because you know, this is an open conversation. Um, if you're using an example, they, they talked about one of the ones that really caught, has caught my attention is the, um, the, the Honda City, which is described in quite a lot of detail in the new product development game. The average age of the team that they got together to come up with the Honda City was 27. Um, they had two objectives given to them one it needed to be because it was that they wanted the honda city to go after the youth car market that needed to be relatively inexpensive with uncompromising quality so it needed to be a really good car that was cheap um, and the the prevailing thought of the time was a low long car like the honda civic at the time was the best design of a car but they transcended that they ended up coming up remember that the original honda cities and the honda cities are quite a short and high car um, they completely they completely went against the, the accepted norms of cars. But what they came up with was what Honda implemented on the basis of what they'd learned. They did studies, they did travel Europe, they did all sorts of stuff to understand the best design for a car for the youth market of today. Um, one would probably argue that they copied quite a lot of the concepts of the uh, of the mini of uh, the mini Coopers and stuff. But nonetheless, they came up with a really impressive car, um, and they broke all the rules. But again, they weren't producing the car, they were just designing what would be produced. Now, um, I don't want to go into too much detail in here, but this is the key elements that they discovered that all of those soft, all of those companies had, not necessarily, none of them were software product companies, right? That's an eight, in the 80s, that wasn't a massive thing, to be honest, for those that remember way back then. Um, but what they discovered was these teams and these companies had built an instability. And what that means is that they were given, basically given a checkbook and given a lot of pressure and, and short timelines, but other than that, they would just let, let go. Um, the, the project team self-organized, they were put together, the best of the best were put together and then they would organize themselves. And many of them would actually end up, you know, doing cross learning, trans that they'd transcend themselves, that go beyond the, the expected norms. Um, they had overlapping development phases, um, typical development in General Motors, for example, at the time was what they called phase containment. So each phase had to be completely done before they moved on to the next phase. So they found when they were trying to set up the manufacturing plant that a design was incorrect, it had to go all the way back and then get you know, through change control, get changed to the point that it could be redesigned. And what they did is actually just blurred the lines of the development phases. So the design and, and the implementation and the factory setup could be done not at the same time, but they would interact with each other a lot more smoothly. And when you think about what Scrum does, that definitely has that concept where you're interacting heavily with, with product development. Multi-learning, in that people would learn not only other people's jobs, but they'd start to learn all sorts of stuff. They'd go out into the market, they'd learn what's going on, they'd become enthusiastic about it, learning. Subtle control um, is, you know, they would be encouraged to go and learn, they'd subtly be given, you know, they'd be funded, they'd be put in a different room, even to the extent that the NECPC, they'll put in a completely different building and just let go. And um, organizational transfer of learning, what often happens with these teams, they, they actually want to teach other people what they're doing, and they'll transfer what they've learned. As I said before, Marty Kagan has written a book about empowered product teams. 
I personally don't like the concept of ordinary people making extraordinary products. I don't consider myself to be ordinary. Um, I'm sure none of you on this, this call consider yourself to be ordinary. Um, so the idea of ordinariness being a, a prerequisite to join a team doesn't really thrill me, but it's a good book nonetheless. Uh, and then if you haven't ever read Software for Your Head, um, do. It's an awesome book about team dynamics and how teams, how teams should work together. It's one of Craig's favorite books about you know, the deep studies and, and, and human dynamics of, of, of team being part of a team. So finding a product is not easy, right? And, and I think one of the things that, as I said earlier on, you know, um, when, when you're on the product development side, you're inside a scrum, you know, you're building a scrum team, you're, you're building software, you assume the other side of the fence is easy um, and deciding what to build and defining requirements and stuff is a simple thing to do. It really, really is, it's wicked hard. So I just wanted to talk about, because I'm passionate about product management and I, I do, you know, do advisory work on for, for startups on, on defining their products and shaping their products. But um, I think this is great. More often than not, what we think the right way to build software is, and especially when you're in the context of a, of a software services or internal software product company, the idea is you go to the senior people or the senior stakeholders and say, what do you want this software product to do? Right? And as Henry Ford quite rightly points out here, if it would ask people what they wanted before the car had turned up, they would have just wanted faster horses, right? Um, and, and another, I don't, actually, no one's actually sure if this is actually Henry Ford's quote, but it's a good one nonetheless, right? It, it's often a, a quoted to him. Um, but the same goes for no one knew they needed an iPhone. In fact, if you'd said to people 15 years ago, we're going to make a device that you're going to look at all the time and you're going to be able to look at the internet and it's going to have your calendar, it's going to have, you're going to have video calls on it and you'll spend all your time with your head forward looking at this thing and you probably walk into lampposts, right? They would have said, I don't want that, I'll never need that, right? And yet everyone's got one, right? So you ask people what they want, they won't tell you what the new product's going to be, right? So finding the product and innovating products is really hard. Um, and this is another example. You, you know, you might be told um, you need an electric drill with a quarter inch bit. Right? That's not what I want, right? What I might, what I actually want is a quarter inch hole, right? So the job I want done is a quarter inch hole and maybe an electric drill is the only way you can do that, right? So uh, um, what job is this thing doing? What's, what job is this doing for the user of it? Maybe warming up some tea. Yeah, yeah. It's make it's potentially making you a cup of tea, or you could be warming it up to uh, to make some ramen noodles really quickly. Right, but generally it's making a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Right. So yeah, the, the job it's doing is not warming up water. It's making you making you something, helping you make something, doing a job for you. I think you can make popcorn in those too. Y yeah, actually. <laughs> So that is why I, that's why I said, is this a better product? Because it probably, this probably makes it easier for the Keurig, it's easier to make a cup of coffee, right? But you're certainly not going to be making popcorn in this, right? <laughs> right? Nor uh, for those who've had Keurig tea, not a very good cup of tea. Right? If you're you know, you Kiwi slash English like me, it doesn't make good tea. Right? Well, and it doesn't actually make that good a coffee either. But you know what I mean? The, the concept is there that this is doing the job in a more direct way for you. So how does all this work in a, in a software context? And we're going to get into this and then hopefully get into this, some discussion as well. Um, I'm actually going to make it in about 40 minutes, I think, Gene. So we're, we're doing well. This is a good, this is a good first outing. Um, so, you know, we've got a product team here. They came up with the idea that they want to make a cup of tea and it needs some hot water, right? I'm going to go to that in a second. Needs hot water. And I'm hoping you can see it. You know, and they develop the product team, direction of the or the, the delivery teams with the direction of product teams makes a kettle. Um, do you call it a kettle here or a jug? I can't remember. Kettle, right? Um, so let me go back again. Um, th this is genuinely oversimplifying the job of a product team or a product development team. Um, product development has all sorts of areas that they need to think about. Data analytics, for those of you uh, who are building, you know, consumer software products, you, you always think about, you know, you've got various different tools you can plug into your UI, like Heap, Heap etc., that can look at, you know, use, use use of your platform and use of the UI. Research, market research, you need to understand finance, 
can understand P&L and profit and loss and the cost of product development, as well as the cost of product running the product. You need to understand product operations and support, leadership, software technology, uh, really key job in product development is the ability to say no, user experience design, marketing, communications. Product, a product manager has got, um, I, I don't sort of like the, the, the sort of the um, macho-ness of it, I guess, but you know, you listen to people talking about the product manager's job and you'll often hear, you know, that you need to be able to work 60 hours a week and, it's, and you're buried in data and hard, and it's really, really hard. It's true, it's really hard. Um, I don't think necessarily the 60 hour week thing needs to come with it as well, but it is, it is a really deeply complex job with a lot of different areas involved in it. Um, this is a direct quote from Marty Kagan. Um, and as he says here, I've long argued that innovation is all about the team. Um, and he goes, most companies, technology teams exist to serve the business, which is what you often see that whole thing coming into the person's office and getting, you know, what do you want done next? Um, but actually in very strong product organizations is to serve the customers in a way that meet, meets the needs of the business. So a, an empowered, a genuinely empowered product team has all the authority and empowerment to come up with products and product, product services that they can take directly to market to make money or deliver value for the business that they work on. That's the difference. They're not just there to be told what to do, but they're there to, to innovate and change. So this is where I want a bit of discussion as well. So Marty Kagan's um, view is that the, the product team needs three people in it. He calls it a triad, um, a product manager, a designer, and a lead engineer. And that, that concept behind that is the product manager's out doing all the things I talked about, market research, understanding what to do next, understanding what job the product's supposed to be doing, what job it's doing for their users, what problem they need solved. Designer takes that job and product and thinks about how to make it into a, a genuine user experience. And the lead engineer is there to understand, you know, can it be implemented, feasibility, timelines, options, et cetera. So those three are the, what he would call the product team. Um, I see chats, are there questions coming in? Um, so I'll look at those in a second. Um, but let's discuss, given the various contexts that you all work within, who should really be in this product team? Because it wasn't just three people in the new product development game. The teams varied in size you know, up to 10, 15 people. So who do you believe in the context of software development should be in the, the product development team? to use the term from the new product develop, develop, development game. Who's there defining the product and thinking about what it needs to do and thinking out what it needs to look like and doing the design work? Maybe a customer, if you can get one. <laughs> yeah, 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 or at least engaging directly with customers. Uh, one of the things, I, I'll just throw something out there. I, I often think that support of the product is forgotten. How you know someone from the team that's going to be supporting it, or someone who genuinely understands you know maintainability, supportability, etc. It, it is how often have we built a software product that only the developers can look after? So you know why wouldn't they be in the product team defining? Other thoughts? I'm assuming I mean, it's everyone that's necessary to deliver the solution. Design solution, at least, yeah, 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 yeah. Why do you say design and not deliver? Yeah, so they, so the way I have a picture here. Let's have a look. Yeah, I've got it here. So putting it together, right? So there's two aspects. There's discovery, which is you know all about learning and learning velocity, and there's development, which is development velocity. We want predictable, high quality, sustainable software. Discovery is about figuring out what that thing needs to do. So the product development team is largely in this space, right? But there's a huge overlap. They're constantly working with the team underneath. Um, and this is from Jeff Patton's stuff. I love those who know Jeff Patton will have heard of Jeff Patton, you know. Well, he, he's awesome too, and I've worked with him a lot. But the concept that he, he has is that this team is constantly interacting. So I have a question, what should it do? You know, um, we've got a new idea. Let's make sure that that gets into the next piece of the backlog that needs to be implemented right in the next release. Right? And obviously, you know, release, measure, learn. So we get the software into some form of production or some, in some way that it can be measured. That feeds back into this cycle as well. Um, 
and then obviously one of the things you need to do is just is most most of your ideas you need to say no to so you need to kill right so there's the there's two different aspects to software product development discovering it and developing it discovering it's really 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 hard i think i've got it here right? um, doing so, it, I, wicked hard doing this is wicked hard yeah i've always struggled with that one because i've i've heard people interpret this as well okay let's have a business analyst team and, <laughs> and we'll have a development team and <laughs> Uh, so maybe you could maybe you could uh, uh, knock that down and say, well, here's what it really means. Yeah. So a business analyst, I would have the business analyst sitting. If you need to have a business analyst, they would be down in here, right? Because yeah. that's part of the software product development, right? And actually, or maybe the the, the bridging the gap between the two. Although bridging the gap should really be done by you know specification, by example, and, and automated test. But regardless of that. That is not a business analyst team. This is a team that's understanding what needs to be built and what jobs need to be done. Right? So again, that's what the, the stuff here, right? They are figuring out what product is needed, right? And how to innovate and change the market and come up with the next iPhone, come up with the next major innovation of the product, right? Which keeps us ahead of the game and, and come up with new, so as, you know, new product development game. The whole concept was it is most of the revenue from companies is going to, is going to be now from new products right and new innovations a business analyst team is not coming up with new innovations a business analyst team is defining requirements in a way that can be interpreted by a developer and turned into code but if you have a, a scrum team and everyone on the team needed to you know deliver the product i guess that's where we're coming full circle here uh this this model doesn't this model shows two different scrum teams that no. are no no, no, okay. They're different, right? They're not the same, right? So they're doing they're doing different things, right? So while the construct of the team, the, the base construct of the teams are the same, right? They're cross-functional multi-learning teams, right? The ones building the software are cross-functional in terms of, you know, for example, we might have um, uh, a React UI, yes, we might have Java, we might have, you know, some other language and, and components, those, and, and also you may even have a tester in there and you may have a business analyst in the software development team, right? right? But what you have in the, in the let's call it product discovery team, because that's the confusing bit, right? The product discovery team would have someone from marketing, would have someone from the business, would have user, you know, user, maybe they'd be the ones that arrange, you know, uh, user discovery groups. They'd be the ones that do user test, you know, user, uh, interviews that do market research that be looking at what's happening in production on the system and looking at like the heat results and saying well users aren't using this particular button wonder why right what do we need to do to make this button more usable or this feature more usable we need to so they're looking at all of those aspects that a software development team doesn't do right? it's not what they that's not what they're here to do you could potentially make them do that but actually their job is to build high quality software right? and but how do i discover what to build more often than not, you do need someone who deeply understands product marketing and marketing. You need someone who understands finance. You need someone who understands you know, the market and the environment that you're in. You need someone that understands user, user interface design. Have you ever seen a developer's UI? It's awful, right? <laughs> right? So yeah. but if you, haven't, you, you need someone who can design a user experience and design the, 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 the UI that then feeds into the software development process. And more, more often than not, in fact, almost always, that product discovery team will have multiple development teams working for it, multiple. So there's a one-to-many relationship between that team and, and the production of the of the product. So which is what I was trying to say. This is why I, this is kind of this thing's been um, bugging me for years, and it took me a long time to get this working properly. What they're not doing is this, right? The soft, and this is a bad analogy, right? Because software developers would feel would feel pretty offended by the idea that they're producing a car. But they're not, the software developers are producing a quality product. They're not coming up with the brand new Honda City car, right? If that makes sense, right? Their job does, is to develop high quality. Does, does this dual track result in a waterfall? Why or why not? No. No, because this is not the business analyst team, right? But the requirements are being discovered and then they're being handed like a handoff, right? 
Yeah, well, it's not quite that simple, right? It's not just a handoff. So mm. say, for example, I've now figured out what we need to build in order to innovate our product, right? Then there's a constant interaction between this team and the development team to, un to make sure they understand this and it's defined in the right way. So it's not a waterfall. This is still agile underneath and this is agile at the top. And in actual fact, good product discovery teams will, will just will, will, will produce, you know, often do prototyping and stuff. They'll do, you know, five to 10 prototypes a week. Right? It's not, this is not, we're going to spend months and months figuring this stuff out. It would cool. be a mistake to turn this into a waterfall. But this, what my point being, that's wicked hard. Really, it's wicked hard. And what you often think when you're in the software development teams is that's not hard. Just get, give me the requirements, could you hurry up? And also, often happens at the top when you're defining the product and you're coming up with a good idea, you think the development of the software is easy. How many times you've been told, well, you should be able to do that by next week, right? No, it's wicked hard, right? So really that discovery team is more in the small spikes, throwaway code, learning can be uh, yeah. yeah production grade software it's which one do which we one works to? right and i don't know if you've read there's some really good books out there problem about, um, are we avoiding seeing? building code as well because often you can just you know i think there was a guy who produced a company selling shoes online and all he did was put a front end on an email right and then once it started to get traction he realized he needed to start automating the, the, the logistics right so then they built more and more of the platform behind it but initially it's just a screen with an email right? That he got on his email uh, uh, inbox and looked, okay, so this person wants a size 10 shoe, right? Okay, <laughs> you know, that was it. But then obviously as the business grew, he built more and more technology in and started building out more of the product underneath it to support that, the, the needs of the business. But why, why build everything up front? Why, like you say, why would you do a waterfall and say, well, my prediction is I'll need all of this stuff in order to make this business work. No, it's really quick, fast spikes that often you know, can be in production and actually test the market as well. Gordon, I apologize. I was I was a little late. Um, when I've seen Jeff talk about this in the past, he talked about it in terms of it's the same team. They just have these two different backlogs. One's a discovery and one's a you know an implementation. Uh, but I think he made a point that it's the same team that's working both. Did were you suggesting that? at some scale you end up having a team that's doing discovery and a team that's doing yeah, it, the other i, I missed because i missed all that I'm yeah no it, it's not it's it's not the same team um there can be there can be crossover so you could have like some of the engineers up working doing discovery from down here right but that it, you, you don't you wouldn't have in a software product development team right marketers and and, and finance people and product marketing and uh, UX design. People. I think when I saw Patton talk about this, this is a couple of years ago, was pre-pandemic. I think he was talking about it being more mixed. Now, maybe that's evolved or your view has evolved. I, I no, yeah. Well, it's, it's actually, maybe my memory is bad. This is a picture from the <laughs> article called Dual Track, Not Dual Track, right? And, and it's yeah. thing, there are two teams. But it's two teams working together and constantly passing information between each other, right? Uh, okay. Um, but that, what he didn't want is it to be a duel, as in you know, shooting each other because they don't like each other. Right? When um, I remember him presenting this, and I think this was in a single team context. Yeah. He was not saying there were two separate teams. But right. then, yeah, yeah, yeah. my memory yeah. may be. Yeah. No. It, 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 right. Yeah, they're, they're doing two different things, right? And if you then talk, if you look at what Marty Kagan recommends, which influenced Jeff's thinking, he says you need a product manager, a designer, and a lead engineer, right? But the lead engineer is the crossover, right? Because the lead engineer is also working with the development teams, right? So yeah, but uh, but the product manager and the designer are not part of the development teams. So yeah, and and it is a wicked, like I said, it's a wicked hard problem that needs. You know, a particular set of skills and knowledge that is different from the wicked hard problem of building software. And if you're a super small organization like a little startup, then they're all the same, right? You've only got ten. You've only got. Uh, I, I think that may have been the context in which he was speaking. Mm. Yeah, when you're a startup, these are all blended together, right? And actually, that's one of the things having advised a lot of startups that they struggle to break apart, right? 
and, and that eventually you need to scale and to scale you need to have not separate them out i hate that's why that his, his talk and, and his article is saying we don't want it to become a dueling thing where the product team hates the development team and the other way around right the company i'm at now that was the case everyone was trying to blame each other not anymore right we now work really closely together but that's really important right? that it doesn't become a, a fight but when you scale you need teams that are focused on discovering the product what needs to be built and teams that are, that are focused on building building the software one thing I, I really like about this, and one thing that makes me sad, one thing I really like is not everything needs code in order to learn. You can you can put um, you know mockups in front of people and get feedback yeah. from customers and learn quick and iterate without actually having to push code. Yeah. But then the thing that makes me sad is that if this gets institutionalized like too much, then the teams are are not responsible for learning or interacting directly with the customer. It, it almost kind of like makes it look yeah. like, oh, you don't interact with the customer. That's what this team does. And that's what I meant by like the business analyst team. To, uh, maybe that's not the right Word. analogy, but um, yeah. the UX team versus the, yeah. And that, yeah. But again. Yeah. Well, you know what? Well, again, it, it's a it's a type of human as well, right? It, the type of human who loves solving complex code problems isn't necessarily the type of human that is perfect to interact with the customer and understand the needs of the customer uh, i don't i don't know that about that one but uh, well uh, and, some some of the developers it, i agree with that actually because some of the, develop, the most brilliant developers i've met are some are on the spectrum or they have asperger's or whatever like you put them in front of a customer they're gonna like clam up and they won't know what to do or say but they can develop some brilliant I mean, solutions I think um, that, that's one aspect of it the other aspect is you put someone in front of a user and you and, and often what happens, especially a business analyst, right? Um, sorry, am I talking to you, David? Um, will ask the user what they want, right? <laughs> what do you want? Oh, okay, I wanted to do this. And yesterday I was really annoyed by how this works. So can you do this too, right? And they'll sort of sharpen their pencil and write that down and take it back to the development team and say, right, this is what they want, so go and do it, right? A, a product discovery team is not doing that, right? They're assimilating tons of data of which some of it is what people want, but also understanding what the market needs, how to penetrate the market, how to disrupt the market, how to make a complete difference. Software developer isn't trained or necessarily wants to be trained in how, how to disrupt markets. They want to be trained in how to, they, they, they care about building great products. Yeah. And again, when you're a software developer and an engineer with an engineering mindset, you think that stuff's easy, but it's not. You know, figuring out how to disrupt a market and coming up with the idea of a my phone is not easy when that's not the norm. Coming up with an automobile when the norm was a, was a horse is not easy. Right? It's not something, you know. Great. So I'm not sure I buy it, but I think it's interesting to compare it. I, I do buy the, you know, the startup version of you're doing both of this it is true that you're doing both of these activities, however you choose to manifest that. Um, both are definitely happening. Um, I think if you look at this from the lens of a, the leading team idea in less, it's different, but it's not like radically different. No, it doesn't have to be, right? And maybe that's, that maybe that's an instantiation of it. But the leading team would have slightly different people in it too, right? Yes, except I remember the question is, is a leading team like, how does a leading team become the leading team would be the, yeah. the, the, that, the, the question there on the dynamic. They're often solving different things too, right? So Craig's, Craig's view of a leading team is, you know, say, for example, there's um, you, you want to build a new method of scaling into your platform, right? Or you want to add, say, some form of bus to it, right? Now it tends to be nerdier. In, in yeah, that's, that's the point, right? So yeah, yeah. first implementation of this of this new technology or new new um, we we want to we want to you know we want to put this we want to see if we can run our platform in Kubernetes. Let's use that because everyone everyone thinks it's cool right now, right? Or we want to start looking at how we can make it cloud. You know, these bits of the cloud native. And there's a feature. Two teams have a feature each. One both of them need it. And the idea of that, the, the idea of a leading team is that what you decide on a leading team to implement it first and then share it with everyone else, right? But that's a really problem. To I don't know if it's that narrow. I'm, I'm out yeah. of curiosity. I'm I'm going to look it up real quick. And then, but you know, you could be you could be using a leading team to solve a business problem as well. The thing is, how do you find that business problem that needs solving? 
Is the leading team finding that too? I think, I don't think there's a, a reason that it couldn't, right? Yeah, so my premise is that there is a reason that they couldn't because it's a deep skill to learn how to be a product manager and learn mm. how to understand yeah. market disruption. I think it feels like the, the, one of the levers in this whole thing is, you know, you can only really have so many people closely collaborating at the same time. So by oh, splitting this into two tracks, you know, we can probably scale up more. Yeah. It's and it's different skill sets, right? It is genuinely yeah. like learning to disrupt mm -hmm. markets and thinking about markets and product management and gathering all that data is really hard. And if your day job is building code, right, and building high quality code, you know, in a, in a predictable way, a different hat, it's a different hat. It's either a different hat or a different person that works really closely with you. Yeah. The danger, of course, is it turns into like we've just been talking about a dual track where these guys going off coming up with these wonderful ideas and then getting the, the, the engineers to grind it out. That's not what. This is that's not yeah, what, that's what terrifies me. The same thing David talked about. That's what yeah, terrifies it me. can't work like that because that that, that creates tension and, and nastiness, right? And we don't, and we've all seen it right between business and technology. And and I'm terrified of structure that kind of uh, codifies it. That's the if structure drives culture. If you create a structure that's going to drive to that direction, so the question would be, how do you achieve these kind of means? within a structure that uh, doesn't become this thing that we're all, that we all seem to be equally scared about. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not arguing with you. I, I, I bet the, yeah. the point I made earlier on, I've been on both sides of these, like product, the head of product for a, for a small company and also head of engineering for small companies. And they're both really, really hard, right? And, and, and also both of those roles I've worked when I was head of product, I worked incredibly closely with engineers and interacted you know, all the time with them. And when I've been head of engineering, in fact, my current place I'm at, I uh, changed the name of my organization from you know, development to product engineering. Right? Because we're about building a product. We are a massive, massive biggest product company in, in wealth management. Um, and, and all we are here for is to build a product that, that serves our, our market and our, our end users, which happen to be within different organizations. So if you, even just changing the name changes the, the appearance of, of what you're doing and how, and how you want to interact with people. Anyway, um, I, I told Gene that I'd probably ruffle some feathers in this call and I, I'm glad I did. I, I'm glad that you're all thinking about it. And, and um, it's, you know, it sort of runs again, something somewhat in the face of how we, how we like to work and also did and I like the, the reaction conjure concepts of you've got a team coming up with, you know, the clever team coming up with requirements that are firing it off to the development team and, and telling them to get on with it, right? That's not what this is about. But could be construed that way. It's funny because I'm considering working with a client right now that has like a marketing and UX team and then a, a develop and then some development teams. And I'm just I'm at first, it's funny that you're have, we're having this uh, presentation today because it's it, it could be like this. I'm not sure if they're doing it the right way or the wrong way. Um, my first reaction was hmm, maybe we should get all the skill sets and you know make teams that have all the same similar skill sets and so they can take the next biggest feature or the, or the next most important feature on the backlog and um, be, have adaptability that way. Yeah, the, the, the down, the, 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 not the problem, but one a way to consider that. So UX and stuff, right? UX is a good user experience designer. It's coming up with user experience across multiple different you know, features and facets of the system, right? Yeah. If you, if you, I'm not saying lock, but if you put them within the construct of a feature team or a development team, right? Then they're only going to look within the const. One, though, they won't. They'll, they'll be underutilized significantly too. Mm -hmm. it's looking at the at the at the bounds of the feature that they're working on or the stories that they're working on, they won't come up with a user experience design. They'll come up with a with a UI design right, for whatever feature they've got. So you you know there is a need to come up with the overall context right and, and understand the overall um, implementation and design that then feeds into the development. And, they need, and actually dual track came from user experience, right? The concept of dual track was user experience is constantly evolving and constantly interacting with the development of that UI. Right? 
it's 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 closely interacting, but it's not the same. Right? You, and if you put it within the development teams, and they're only looking at the small context as opposed to the broader context of the user and the user and the user community. So I think it's dangerous to think you could just give a user experience to one, you know, multiple different feature teams and say, well, you're all going to do it independently because I don't know how that, well, they'd have to do a lot of collaboration. It's also kind of an expensive way to achieve the same goal. You, you know, I was considering taking some training around this. There's like a scrum.org um, professional scrum with user experience training. Do you know, do you put any weight behind the, is this good training, you know, or do they or do they promote putting a ux person on each team and and creating that kind of local optimization that they, but that is very local optimization right yeah right <laughs> um honestly if there's anything you can find that um that jeff Patton is training okay i would go with that All right yeah he, he uses uh um have you ever heard of user story mapping oh sure yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's best way to come up with what the user experience and, 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 and the overall implementation is there, as well as the interactions with humans right mm -hmm. cool thanks yeah hey, uh, uh gordon i just want to make sure we are you know, in the time as well so, uh, i would like to ask everyone to if you have another question maybe to you know, i would add gordon and uh otherwise we will gradually start wrapping up um i see more people join later in the in the hour on the hour so maybe next time we do it we're going to push it a little further by six ish but uh anyway uh gordon maybe you want to take another few questions from people yeah if people have got them for sure yeah we'll watch you we'll watch time yeah anyone else wants to um throw a curveball at gordon Okay. Listen, uh, so what we're going to do, um, you have, you've used the, uh, I think you used the deck, right? So the sooner you ship it over, the sooner I'm going to make it available. And of course, this, this recording, hey, someone's speaking at some point. And it's, so, yeah, yes. Is there is someone speaking? No, someone is having a mic. I don't know. But we're going to make this available. Uh, shortly for everyone to use uh, the, the video and the and slide and the material. So, but personally, I would like to thank you very much for joining. And uh, next time uh, we do this, no, I, I had one more question. But if you want, uh, oh yeah, I think we need to mute. You. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So next time we do it, hopefully we can actually make it in town. You can make it to town, and I can do a better job securing a good venue so we actually can have it in person and get some traction both in person and virtually okay um i don't have anything else so i want to thank you all for joining thanks gene nice event thanks, gordon thanks everyone and david everyone who came up with questions ben everyone thanks, great folks. You. yeah it's good uh good conversation thank you everyone, special thank you special thank you Spe special thanks to you gordon yeah no, thank you all it's great thanks a lot right. bye yeah bye Thank you, folks.